is in-depth. We shall be going in-depth today with a woman who I describe as a fireball. Now, in-depth is really about helping our youth to understand the role that they play in ensuring that we get the kind of governance that we deserve. And today, I'll be going in-depth with Ndidi Moneli, who is going to address the topic, help our youth, the truth, to know. Now, if you checked online, what you'll probably find that describes Ndidi is this, and I'm going to read it. This is what Wikipedia says you are, Ndidi, if I say hello. Ndidi Okonkwo Moneli is an expert on African agriculture and nutrition, philanthropy, and social innovation. She has over 25 years of international development experience and is a recognized serial entrepreneur, author, public speaker, and consultant. Through her work in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors, she has led the design and execution of high impact initiatives focused on policy, strategy, organizational design, ecosystem solutions, and growth. How does that feel hearing you describe that way, Didi? Humbled and honored, uh, but really still very challenged to actually live up to a lot of the promise uh, that we have kind of been working on for the last 20 something years. And Adesua, you and I have been on this journey for a long time. Um, and it's one step forward, two steps back often. So that's my, my philosophy at the moment. So the very first book you ever wrote was something some people may see as a, as a Christian book, as a religious book. So you wrote a book, Working for God, in the market, but it also speaks to the economics of working generally in our country. True or false? Yes. Yeah, so I wrote this book um, as my first book because I, I felt it was important for young people to understand that they could reflect the values of God in their workplace. Um, and it was really an important message. It just is this case studies of young people's lives who are entering the workforce and trying to reflect the values of their faith in their work. Uh, oftentimes, we are called to have them as two distinct um, and callings. And I believe you have to reflect your faith in your, the way you address your work ethic, the way you treat others, um, integrity and honesty, kindness, tenacity. And so each of these stories really is a, a true life stories. I just masked the names of the individuals, but wanted to give young people, including myself at the time, hope that it was possible to reflect these values, especially in the business world, where oftentimes we are called to be, you know, almost ruthless and to cut corners to achieve profits. Um, so that was why I wrote the book. It inspired me and it's inspired many other young people. Now, what I find interesting about the fact that you did this is that you felt something, you decided to do something about it, right? And you were yourself then pretty young, under 30, when you wrote that book, right? And so when you look at the young people today, what bothers you and hurts you the most when you think about them and what they do? Yeah, so, you know, I started Leap Africa when I was 28 and had the good fortune of being the pioneer executive director of Faith Foundation when I was 25. So I've been, I've been at this for a while. Um, and the many other ventures I've started and initiatives I've started, um, there are two things. I think many young people don't realize how powerful they are. Um, they have energy, they have skills, they are willing to take risks. They're more courageous because they have less to lose. So they are our biggest assets, but they don't realize that they are assets. They don't realize they have power to effect positive change in society. So from the book, from the many initiatives I've started, the whole conviction is let's empower young people to be leaders of today and tomorrow. Let's enable them to realize that they have what it takes to effect change and that they can do more in their youth. Um, and this has really propelled my work 
You know, when I started Leap a day so I thought I think I met you when I was pioneer ED of fate. But when I started Leap, I remember being told as a young person that I was a leader of tomorrow. They told me that when I was 10 years old. They told me that when I was 20 years old. And then by 28, I realized these same people are in their 60s and they're still telling me I'm leader, a leader of tomorrow. What does tomorrow hold in a country where the life expectancy is 57? You know, I might not make it to 60 to start leading, right, in their book. And realizing that leadership is an act, not a position. It's what you do that makes you a leader, not your title. And so we started LEAP, which stands for Leadership, Effectiveness, Accounting, and Professionalism, 20 years ago, to inspire, empower, and equip the next generation of African leaders who are credible, who are dynamic, who are innovative, who lead transformation in their communities, in their companies, and in their countries. And that was the vision we set out very early on. And I'm proud to say that we, we've started that movement, but it's not easy. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. As you say this, right, we know in Nigeria today, things look like they are really blah. Recently, people have been killed in different parts of the world. I mean, different parts of the country. Recently, as recent as they were having this conversation, for example, just yesterday, worshippers were murdered in a church. You know, with things like this happening, I mean, my thing, couldn't youth have been involved? Are they being used to do things like this? Definitely. So one of the books we wrote at Leap is called Rage for Change. Yesterday, I felt the rage. Adesua, you felt the rage. Many young people felt the rage because young people are being used as weapons of war in our country. And yet, they are also young people being killed by other young people. We're killing our children. We're killing our elderly. Um, these young people are unemployed, right? These young people who are being as weapons of war, weapons of destruction are unemployed. They're hungry and they're vulnerable because they're in positions of um, very vulnerable positions because they don't have access to power and resources. And I always tell uh, individuals who are policymakers that if we can create jobs for young people and empower them to be entrepreneurs, to create jobs for themselves, we won't have these many young people who are vulnerable to evil uh, influences. What we're seeing across Nigeria is a failure of leadership, but it's also a continued effort to block young people from assuming those roles. If we look at the statistics at this, well, officially, we still say that we have unemployment in the low digits. But when I looked at the statistics, and ILO had this a new, few years ago, over 70% of our youth were unemployed and 90% were underemployed. When you're unemployed, you, you wake up in the morning with nothing else to do, right? You're hungry, you're angry, and you're idle, right? And when you're idle, you're vulnerable. When you're underemployed, it means you have access to some form of employment, but it's not a full work week. So you're working maybe for 10 hours, hawking on the streets or whatever it is. It is not enough to keep body and mind together. Now, this is a barrel of a, a, almost like a cannon barrel waiting to explode. What do we expect when we have such huge numbers of unemployment and underemployment amongst our youth who have energy, who have skills, who have talent, who are brilliant, who can be leveraged for good, but instead are being leveraged for evil? And for me, that, that makes me exceedingly upset and angry. Our biggest assets in this country are young people. They are the biggest asset, and we're wasting that asset. With every minute that goes by, we're wasting that asset. And that is a travesty. When we say help our youth, the truth to know, is it possible? Can we honestly say our truth, are, I mean, our youth are doing the right thing? Can't they take control and refuse to be manipulated? and do what is right. So when I think about the term help I youth the truth to know, I think about three things. The first one is what is the truth and who has defined the truth? So we've lived in a country where that truth has become masked. There's a lot of gray. There's no black and white anymore. At Leap Africa, we introduced an integrity institute very early in our history, maybe 18 years ago, the first integrity institute in Nigeria. And what shocks me Adesua is that many young people don't know the difference between right and wrong. If you ask them, have you ever taken an exam for someone else? About 50% raise their hand. 
Have you ever cheated in an exam? About 90% raised their hand. Have you ever lied on your resume? About 50% raised their hand because it's become acceptable, right? And so through this program, we teach young people that really, if you lie on your resume, if you lie, if you cheat on an exam, you are only making it worse, not just for yourself, but others, because then you live in a broken system. You go to a hospital, you have a doctor who somebody else took all the exams for them and they're the ones treating you. Then why do we die on the operating table? Because we have unqualified doctors, unqualified nurses who have cheated their way through the system. It affects you, it affects me. We have teachers who uh, have a fourth grade education because somebody else has teach, cheated and lied for them to get into the teacher training college and to pass. So if we create a system where it's okay to lie and cheat, then we have created a, a system that doesn't work. We've created a state that doesn't work. We've created a community that's broken. And so we have to be the change. And I've realized through this program that we have to reinstate what it means to be honest and to have integrity and authenticity. And that has to be incorporated in our curriculum from first grade all the way to university. So integrity, 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 the truth has to be redefined, right? And guess what? We all profess faith, Christianity, Islam. The truth is enshrined in both of these religions. So that truth is the basis for any country or any community or any functional society to work. So that's the first thing we have to define the truth. The second thing at Deswa is that we have to have clear punishment and recourse for bad behavior. And this is where the judiciary comes in. This is where our traditional rulers come in. This is where faith-based leaders come in across the society where there is bad behavior we need a society that calls it out and holds us accountable because what young people tell me is, yes, I'm honest, I'm accountable, but those who are not honest and not accountable get away with it. They're promoted. They're exalted. I feel bad for being honest. I am punished for being honest. So we have to reverse that. We have to make sure that we celebrate honesty, integrity, and authenticity in our ecosystem. And it starts in every aspect, our families, our churches, our schools, all the way to the top. Call out bad behavior, celebrate good behavior. And then the third thing is, I really believe as a nation, we have to repent. And it's some, actually have some mass programs similar to what we had in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, or even in Rwanda, in Germany, because the pain and the suffering is too deep. And if we don't repent and heal as a nation, we can't move forward. So the individual action is critical, which I've talked about. The societal action is critical, but the national action is critical. This all war killings. Yes, they have to be some truth and reconciliation around what has happened. Because otherwise you're creating a next generation of suicide bombers. Children who witnessed that, who survived that, whose parents died, are in pain. How do we protect them so that they, they don't become the next perpetrators of murder because they've experienced it firsthand? A nation that refuses to own up to its sins and refuses to heal as a nation will not move forward. And that's why I look at Germany and Rwanda as examples. And here in this country, we still have so many atrocities that have been committed and there has been no collective healing no collective truth-telling about where we've been and where we need to go. And that's important. Very, very deep. I, w I know I didn't make a mistake having you here. I mean, I just want to, I mean, you've tidily put it together where each responsibility lies. So for me, as I return to the conversation here, I'm wondering, how does all this affect our moving forward? I'm doing this personally because I believe there are some things we need to do right before we start casting ballots in 2023. So as you look towards 2023, you look at our youth, you look at the situation, what pops into your head about the things that we should know and should be doing? Well, this morning I posted something on Instagram <laughs> and I, I, it's a famous quote from um, a, a, a Jewish um, writer. Oh, and he said, they came for the trade unionist, but I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. 
they came for the socialists. I didn't speak up because I wasn't a socialist. You know, they came for all of these people and I didn't speak up. And finally they came for me and there was no one else to speak for me. And I said, if we had to translate into the Nigerian context, they came for the poor. I didn't speak up because I wasn't poor. They came for women. I didn't speak up because I wasn't a woman. They came for the Catholics. I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Catholic. They came for the Igbos. I didn't speak up because I wasn't Igbo. They came for the Kanuris. I didn't speak up. And eventually, when it was my turn, there was nobody else to speak up for me because everybody else had been killed. This is the situation we find ourselves. I feel a sense of urgency. And I ended that Instagram post by saying, may God grant us the courage and the wisdom to change the things we cannot accept. Right? I cannot accept that Nigeria is a failed state. I know a lot of people have come out to say that. I cannot accept that. I cannot accept that this is the country I'm leaving behind for my children and grandchildren. I can't accept that. And so what do we need every young person to do at this time? The first is commit to being an honest citizen who has integrity. You have to make that commitment, which means you will not be compromised. You're not going to have stomach infrastructure. Somebody is not going to give you a thousand naira to vote for them. You're not going to steal a ballot box because someone gave you a hundred thousand because you're not linked for this moment. You're thinking about the country that you want your children to grow up in your grandchildren to grow up in. That's what you it is behind at the forefront of every decision you're going to make during this very difficult period. Courage and wisdom to do the right thing. First, first you have to make that commitment. Hold yourself accountable. Secondly, you're going to hold others accountable. And who are the others? The others are everybody in the electoral commission, everybody in the voting booth, everybody in the system. You're going to hold them accountable. You're going to hold those who choose to run for office accountable. And what are you going to be looking for? Number one, what is their track record? What have they accomplished that is good for society? What have they done? We say leadership is an act, not a position. Not what are they going to do, but what have they done to improve the lives of people? Nobody is fit for office if they don't have a track record of excellence. If they don't have tangible evidence of what they have done to improve the lives of people. And, and sorry, boreholes are not enough. Boreholes in my village are not enough. It's really tangible evidence for what they've done for people outside their village, in other villages, in villages for Muslims, if they're Christian, in villages for Igbos, if they're uh, Aousa. What have they done for the masses? What have they done for the most vulnerable? Judge them according to that. Judge them according to their ethics. Do they, have they been indicted in any corruption scandal? Whether it's been cleared on any level, have they been indicted? Are there cases waiting to happen? What is their track record when it comes to ethics and management of resources, right? And what is their reputation and, and track record when it comes to protecting Nigerians and promoting Nigerians devoid of ethnic and religious views? For me, we need a president who loves Nigeria, not a president who loves their own local government. We need a president who loves everybody in this country and who's willing to sacrifice their life for everybody in this country. That's what I need as a president. That's what I need as a governor. That's what I need as a local government chairman. And for me, those standards of excellence have to be set and we have to hold those who are going to vote for to those standards. And then the third thing is where we see wrongdoing, we have to speak up. And this is where moral courage comes in. It's not easy. We're often persecuted, but we need moral courage to speak up. You know, there's a Christian prayer, the Catholic prayer, in fact, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And a young African has changed it. We're not going to accept the things we cannot change. We're going to ask God to grant us the wisdom and courage to change the things we cannot accept. Because we've become too docile as a country where we're accepting things because we think, oh, well, it's out of my control. It's out of my power. Let somebody else do it. And I believe in prayer, but at this one, I was having a debate with someone yesterday and I said, listen, God is not going to send anybody to deliver Nigerians. Nigeria has to deliver Nigerians. God is not a micromanager. He sent us here as agents of change. And we have to reflect that in what we do, the actions we take or the actions we don't take. And we have that responsibility. And young people, this is your time. 
This is your time. If you look at some of the people running for office, they were doing, they started when they were in their 20s and they're telling you to wait for your turn. Meanwhile, they already occupied office in their 20s, in their 30s. So why shouldn't you do the same? We need leaders at all levels to rise up. You talk about we should change the things we cannot accept. We should look at the leaders that we are picking. We should check out for certain things. One thing I can say for the Nigerian youth, though, is going by what happened last year, right, where they occupied the toll gates in Lagos and across Nigeria. It means that if there's a rallying point, the young people can act if there's a rallying point. So what do we need to do differently to ensure that we act continuously to get what we want? Because, again, you say, how are we going to check out the people that are coming out for office? What do we need to do? to be sure that we are picking the right people and there's a sustained effort to make sure that what we want to change does happen. So when you reflect on what happened with the NTARs, first of all, I commend the young people who came out in droves to sacrifice their time, their talent, their resources, and even their lives. But what we saw, and that's why I use the term courage and wisdom, and this why we need both. You need courage and you need wisdom, right? Wisdom to know who to partner with when to come to the negotiation table, when to engage the elderly, who the elderly are that deserve to be trusted, and how to partner. And that's where the wisdom comes through. During this period, when enters, a lot of good elderly people reached out to these young people and said, guys, this is, going, this is the time for us to come to the negotiation table. You've raised awareness at the international front, at the local front, You've gotten unusual suspects ready to support you. You've been able to raise money in ways that are really commendable. Let's come to the negotiation table and really start talking about what we want to change. And the, the response from many of the young people were, no, no, we don't want to talk to these people. No, we don't want to talk to these people. And from my own perspective, there's wisdom. There's wisdom. And I, I know that a lot of things happened and I, it's terrible and I condemn all the violence but what I'm saying is, even now, we need that courage that they demonstrated, their level of organization, their ability to use all sorts of sophisticated fundraising tools to mobilize. But we also need the wisdom to know that even in the elderly population, those of us who are over 40 and above, there are people who actually do care about this country and do have an, a, a good track record who want to work with young people to make change happen. So use wisdom to negotiate how you engage those people. Not everybody wants to use you as a weapon or as a tool. There are people who want to support you. Auntie Adesua, you were very instrumental in my early years. And I depended on you for wisdom and for the platform, right? The same thing. We have our young people who don't want to listen to any of us anymore. They think you guys haven't done anything for this country, what you have to offer. And I think... Honestly, multi-generation partnerships is what's going to get us out of this mess, um, using wisdom and that courage. And so I encourage the young people. My message is really, I know this many generations have failed you and your anger is justified, but they are older people who have repented and recognized they could have done more, but who want to work with you genuinely. Please open your ears and eyes to use wisdom to determine who to work with, when to work with them, and how to work with them. Because you need all hands on deck at this time. I also think we have an untapped resource in the diaspora population. You know, during the NSARS, I got a call from very senior players in the U.S. Sports League who are of Nigerian descent, and they wanted to help. So you have celebrities of Nigerian descent. You have sports stars. You have, they have resources. They have time. They have that platform. Leverage them, galvanize them, and engage them at this time because the future of our country is hanging on a thread. And these elections are really critical to determine whether we move forward together, united as a people, towards a brighter future or whether we continue to regress. Fantastic. I like the fact that you're talking about multi-generational partnerships. You're talking about seeking advice and using wisdom to pick. Now, you've worked with youth over, I mean, 20 years. And um, also, another important thing that you've done is you've gone into a sector that is seen as difficult, but it's, as you say, it's a high 
uh, income generating, but high employment generating uh, sector, difficult as it is, which is farming, right? And um, difficult as it is, given these two experiences, talking to the youth, seeing what you can do in farming, there must be, I believe, a lot that is enough to make you want to give up, right? What are those things that have made you want to give up? How have you used wisdom to navigate that space? And how can the young be able to learn from that as we go on to the final moments of this conversation? Well, Nigeria is naturally endowed for agricultural excellence. And our food is some of the best food in the world. I look at what we have on this con continent and in this country, and I'm just amazed that we haven't even tapped the potential in our food ecosystem. We could be feeding ourselves and feeding the world. God has blessed us with the land, the water, the temperature, everything we need to excel in the agriculture and food landscape. This is an opportunity that God has given us to create jobs and to make money. And it's not just farming. Agriculture and food is from farm to the body. Everything from the seeds and the fertilizer to the primary production to the post harvest storage, the logistics, the processing, the, the caterer, the cook, the chef, um, all the way down to how the food is ingested and what it does when it comes into your body. Food is medicine. Nigeria can be feeding itself and the world, and there's no reason why we haven't achieved this. And so when I look at this sector, I look at opportunities to create wealth, opportunities to transform lives, to ensure gender equity, and to push for the changing mindsets about Nigeria and the world. I use the sushi example. Japanese sushi is ranked number one in the world, right? But Nigerian jollof is 10 times better. Why can't we have Nigerian jollof be ranked the best food in the world? You know, Nigerian suya. Anybody who has tasted suya is like, wow, this is amazing. It can, it, it can definitely displace our, our Thai our chicken satay. Right? There's no reason why our food is not recognized globally. And so there's so much opportunity in this sector, and that's what gets me excited. Is it an easy sector? Absolutely not. But what keeps me in the sector are the young people who work with me. In Ace Foods, 70% of our population is under 35 in terms of our staff population. The same in Sahel Consulting, the same in Nourishing Africa. I'm so excited about these young Africans, these young Nigerians, who believe in this sector, who have committed their lives to this sector, who are not leaving the country, even though they have opportunities to leave because they believe they're creating a mark and they're building for the future. That's what gets me really excited and encouraged about the sector. I also believe we can have a lot to teach the world. I recently gave a TED talk and it's a, a, about the power of your plate and the future of the food ecosystem. And every example I used was from Africa. So many examples right here from Nigeria, because I wanted to show the world that we have examples, we have knowledge, we have resources to teach the world. And I think it's flipping the script at Desua. Because honestly, when you think about it, if the birthplace of the world was Africa, and Africans actually generated most of what we eat in the world, we, we often joke at Changing Narratives Africa that if you've had coffee or Coca-Cola today, you have Africa to thank for it, right? Coca-Cola was made with cola nuts from West Africa, probably from Nigeria, right? We didn't know that. Most people don't know that when they drink Coca-Cola. They don't know that coffee was born in Ethiopia. 18 countries in Africa produce coffee. And the best one I recently learned at Deswa is that okra, the word okra, is an Igbo word. It was found in the colony of Virginia in 1650-something and adopted by the whole world as okra. That's why seafood gumbo from New Orleans is still identical to seafood okra from southeastern Nigeria today. We have contributed historically so much to the world, and we still have so much to contribute through our food. And yet we don't even appreciate it, right? Amala is amala and I wedu. It's is so exotic and tasty. The world is waiting for it. So when I think about this sector, I'm just blown away. I think Nigerian fashion, Nigerian music, Nigerian movies, Nigerian food are the next level. And the world is starting to recognize it. We ourselves have to start recognizing it. It has to instill pride within us, but it also has to make us want to work harder to transform this sector. And the youth are the ones pushing all of these frontiers. They are the ones who are pushing these frontiers and we have to support mm -hmm. them. 
So you believe that pride in what you have and it, the dreams that you have are enough to help you push on. Now, which is why I said working with the young, especially through LEAP and the ones that are working for you, all this talk that we hear that our youths are lazy, our youths are not productive, our youth want to check out of the country. What's making this set of youths you're working with different? What are they telling you? Well, what's, when I look at the young people who work with me and who inspire me every day, what they're telling me is that they do love this country and they believe in this country, that they see the potential in this country. Um, and what is different about them is that I've also created an environment for them to shine, for them to learn, for them to grow. I haven't stifled their creativity. They all write articles, which we publish in local and international papers. Their voices are being amplified. They're being given the experience and the opportunity to lead. Um, and I think this is the magic, right? Young people thrive and grow where they're nurtured, where they're supported, and where they're celebrated. Where they're oppressed and where they're deprived of their rights, they shrink. Uh, we all have children. We know that our children glow when they are appreciated, when they are recognized, when we tell them that they're doing well and that we're proud of them. When we chastise them as parents, they shrink. Um, so parenting has taught me a lot about how to engage with young people. And I think that in Nigeria, we need to shift our language from telling our young people their liabilities to telling them that they are biggest assets. But we also need to create spaces for them to thrive, to be celebrated, for their voices to be amplified. We need to create those spaces and we need to make space for them. Reverse mentoring is the key. I'm learning from young people in my ecosystem now. I'm learning from their use of technology, their use of social media, their engagement on platforms. They're inspiring me. They have energy I don't have. Um, and I said, I want to get out of the way for them to lead. And that's why you see in every organization I've started that young people have taken over and I'm just there to provide the guidance and support. Um, we as, as the elders need to know when to step out of the limelight and let the young people take our organizations to the next level. And so for me, that's critical in this country. And that's why it hurts me so much when I see people holding on to power, not realizing that they're stifling the future of the country and the future of the continent. These elders who have done their time need to step away and let the young people come in. Guess what? As our young people shine and thrive, it gives us satisfaction. There's a, a quote that says, the greatest test of a leader is that he leaves behind in others the courage and the conviction to continue. So you have to step aside and watch your, your mentees grow and shine and thrive. And that should give you tremendous pride. Just like we want our children to do better than us. I want every young person who has passed through me to do better than me because that's my legacy. So we also, as adults and the older ones, need to begin to think about legacy, give the younger ones more space to work, and at least give them the chance to prove, you know, after all, I mean, our leaders, the, the, the leaders in the 60s were, you know, all under 30 when they took over. But, you know, we always say that we don't have the young people to do it. But you have proven that given a chance, the young can thrive. And I'm hoping that people will learn from that example. But as we leave, I want you to tell me, because I am very particular about who turns up as the leader of this country or the leader of the, of the states or the houses of assembly around the, around the country. So what, is the, what are the three things that we must keep in our heads, especially for those of us who are, first of all, what are the three things we must do and the three things we must keep in our heads to ensure that 2023 might yet be who for Nigeria? The first thing is that we have to get our PVCs. Everybody keeps on saying this, but it's critical. You have to get your PVC and you have to commit to vote. Regardless of what people are saying against or threatening you that your vote doesn't count, your vote counts. So get your PVC. Commit that your PVC is not for sale. Commit that you don't have a price. That you are building a future for yourself and future generations. That's your commitment. So hold that PVC as something that is sacred, that when you cast your vote, it is your vote for future generations. Number two, hold those who have come out to run for office accountable. Do your due diligence on them. Ask the tough questions. Do your research. What is their track record around impact and integrity? Are they a leader or a ruler? Have they proven that they are 
to be trusted through what they have done, not what they say they're going to do, but what they have done. And number three, protect and fight for your vote. It's not enough to hold people accountable and choose wisely. You need to ensure that your vote is counted, it is protected, and that we have free and fair elections. And there's so many opportunities for you to get involved in initiative right now around checking what is happening, even in the primaries, holding people accountable through the entire process and making sure that after you vote is counted, that your elected official gets into office and that while they're in office, you hold them accountable and support them to succeed. It's not a, a sprint. It's a, it's a marathon. So you need stamina. You need perseverance. You need wisdom. You need courage. But with God helping us, we will get through this because 2023 is pivotal. If I can add one last thing, please, we need women. We need women to come out and make sure their voices are heard. I really believe Nigeria cannot move forward if we don't have equitable leadership at all levels and gender equity at all levels. We need women in positions of authority. We need women in positions of power. We need women of integrity and authenticity to assume those roles. And we need to support the women who are authentic and who are capable to ensure that they fulfill their own mandates. I love that. I love, I love what you've done. But I'm going to ask everybody that comes in depth with me. We've seen, you've told us that you need to grow and they can grow. And you have proven that, right? And you've told us that youth need to get three things done. Get their PVCs, get committed and defend that vote. But before you leave me, I'm going to ask you two very simple questions. One of them is, why are you still in Nigeria? You could as well be anywhere in the world because you are half American. One question. And the last thing, if there's one arsenal, one weapon that is most critical in our arsenal, what is it? So why am I still in Nigeria? Because God planted me here for a reason. And he has told me that my work is to be the light in this nation. And that's the work of everybody who has been planted in this country. We have to be the light. We are lights through the way we work, through the way we live, and through the way we support others. If we all give up on this country, we will leave this country in complete darkness. God has planted us here. I was born here. I'm proudly Nigerian, and God has said, Ndidi, you have to stay here to be the light. My mentor and one of the role models, Christopher Collade, he, he once said in one of the sessions I attended, Apostle in the Marketplace, he said he grew up singing a song, you know, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. So one day he said, but Jesus, you love me. Why did you make me Nigerian? You could have made me Swiss or French. <laughs> you could have made me anything else. And God said, I made you Nigerian because I love you. I made you Nigerian because I have called you for such a time like this. And you are called to be here to be that change agent. So this is my message to all the young people. It's not a mistake that you were born in Nigeria. It's not a mistake. God knew exactly what he was doing. He's planted you here for such a time like this to rise and shine and be the light that this country desperately needs through the way you live, through the way you work, through the way you support others. Be that light. And then the second, what is the arsenal we need? For me, you started off with truth. Truth is an arsenal. Truth is an arsenal. Integrity is an arsenal. Where they are looking for people of integrity, people who they can count on globally. That weapon that you have, that you have an impeccable track record that people can trust you is your arsenal. So commit to living a life of integrity. Commit to living a life of honesty. Doesn't matter what's going on around you. My life is a, a living example that I've taken a very unusual path. But because I committed to life of integrity, God continues to elevate me. It might not make sense now, but trust me, trust me when I say, if you commit to that arsenal of authenticity, integrity, honesty, you will, that weapon, in the day of judgment, that is what people say, can I count on Ndidi? Does she have a price? Can I count on Auntie Adesua? Can I count on her? And if they can count on you, you'll be elevated. You'll be elevated by those around you. You'll be celebrated. So use that weapon. That is a weapon. Because... In, light, in the darkness, they're looking for people of light. Thank you so much.
It's been a wonderful 45 minutes, I hope. I could go on for two days. It is my hope that a lot will take, people will take a lot out of this. But most importantly, it is my hope that people, after listening to this, would like, share, and comment, right? Go to the in-depth channel on YouTube and click on that button like they say. Because that's my desire, that as many people as possible hear this and they do the right thing. But also, it is my desire that even if you're not running for elective office, you can still make a difference. Although I hope one day you will run. Thank you, Didi for being my guest. Thank you so much. Great connecting with you. Enjoy the rest of your day. God bless. That has been in depth today with Didi Okonko Munili, a woman after my heart. Like I said, I hope she runs for office one day. But the thing is, her life has proven that you don't need to run for office to be the best, just to live with integrity. And I want to remind you, please like, follow, subscribe to in depth on our YouTube channel. At least it's our space where we go in depth on issues that can help you be the best that you can be to get the best out of the world that you're living in. We'll see you again.